thought it was just so fucking bad. I just don't understand how the bar is so low. I regret picking up these books. I could have predicted this twist before I predicted my father walking out on the family. I have been so excited about this book. And then I read it. My father already misled me when he said he was going to love me forever. Being muscular and six foot four and an asshole is not a personality trait. He's literally a random collection of floating features on a woolly mammoth. She doesn't even want to be here. Absolutely fucking not. I'll go to jail so fast. It's kind of creepy, but it's so fucking cute. Now let's talk about Ecstasia. His hungry blue eyes. The best thing about that book was the cover. You can't take this character seriously. This is literally a thousand pages of disappointment. What up my channel? Welcome back to another video. I'm Jesse, and you're watching. What's up cuties? It has been a minute since I filmed one of these videos and this video is going to be the latest installment in my books that wasted my time series. If you have not yet seen this series, I will leave the playlist of the previous videos that I have filmed for it linked down below. It is essentially a series where I sit down and talk about the books that wasted my time. I love to gush about books, but every now and again you just need to have a complaint fest and that is exactly what this video is. And I'm really excited to get to complain about them so that I can move on and never think about these books ever 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 again. Before we get into the nitty and the gritty, before we get into the steam and the tea, the scalding that I'm about to depart onto these books, I need to give a big, a big 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 shout out to the sponsor of today's video which is none other than Ana Luisa. Ana Luisa is a jewelry company that offers luxury brand items without those luxury brand prices. They offset 100% of their carbon emissions so you are allowed to treat yourself, treat a loved one, without worrying about breaking the environment. Their website features a wide array of pieces so depending on what your tastes are you're gonna find something for you and their pieces begin at just $39. And before we hop into this video I just want to show off a few of the pieces that they have sent me recently that I'm absolutely loving and obsessed with. The first piece that I'm going to be showing off is one of my new all-time favorites and it is a snake ring. Y'all know, like those of you who know me really well know that I'm obsessed with snakes. I love snake imagery, I love snake jewelry, and so this little gold woven ring with great detailing and a little green jewel for an eye is something that I never want to take off. They also sent over one of my new favorite bracelets which is this really fine delicate gold bracelet that kind of looks like paper clips strewn together. It also goes goes perfectly with this textured bangle and I absolutely had to take these silver hoops home. I am absolutely obsessed with these little mini hoops with the double detailing. I'm a really big fan of short earrings. I love studs and I love tiny hoops and the construction of these is absolutely amazing. Thanks again to Ana Luisa for sponsoring another one of my chaotic videos and without further ado let's shred some books. We are going to be talking about four books. It's it's been a minute since I did a waste my time video that had a bunch of books in it. Lately they've been kind of dedicated videos and so I'm excited. I'm gonna get started by talking about The Spanish Love Deception by Elena Armas. This book so I started this series on my channel where I read my one star predictions and that series kicked off with The Spanish Love Deception and if you want to see just like from start to finish my horrific experience reading this freaking book trying not to pull my eyes out that video is going to be linked down below in the description and the summary of it though so i'm going to give you the abridged version here i just don't understand why we keep hyping up actually no no, no. We, we're not gonna say we because i'm not i'm not a part of this shit why do y'all keep hyping up the most basic mediocre romances that y'all can find. It is confounding. It blows my freaking mind. I know that I have the brain of a dead dinosaur, but still it's, it's being blown regardless. I simply could not stand this book. I hated it. It has over a million reviews on Goodreads. What? It just make it make sense. The first thing that I want to know is why are y'all so thirsty for Jurassic Park? Why are y'all so wet for Jurassic Park? Make it make sense. We get it. Okay, okay, okay. Let's back up. For those of you who are blessedly not in the know about the Spanish love deception, I'm going to give you the briefest synopsis possible so that we can just get into the complaint-a-thon. Okay, so the Spanish love deception is about two babies. Picture Tommy Pickles and Angelica from the Rugrats if they had a romance. That's what the Spanish love deception is. It's basically an office romance where there's a hate to love situation and home girl needs a date to her wedding, her this her family, her sister's wedding in Spain. 
and the man that she absolutely cannot stand offers to be her date to the wedding and so they fly to Spain together and then they fall in love much to the detriment of my reading experience. That is basically what the Spanish love deception is about. This man is just being depicted as just the pinnacle of men. I was curious to find out why. And I think that that's where I went wrong. I think that that's where I went wrong. It's where I so often go wrong with these waste my time books is that I have hope and I have curiosity. I think I just need to stop being curious about this bo these books that y'all are out here hyping because it'll save me a whole lot of, of time and brain cells. I really have to squirrel the, away the brain cells that I have. Here's what I don't get about the Spanish love deception and about romance books that have this trope of this really tiny girl and this man who's just absolutely massive. Here's what I don't get. Why are y'all so thirsty for Jurassic Park? Everybody is tripping over themselves over this like six foot four man and the descriptions of this man in relation to absolutely innocuous objects in everyday life was so deeply disturbing. There were multiple scenes where they were described I'm sorry, it's so ridiculous. Where this man would do something innocent like sit in a chair and then we would have to read multiple sentences about how little he made the chair look with his giant woolly mammoth body. If you just want to date a Tyrannosaurus Rex, say that. It's okay. It was a lot. It was very disturbing. And the way that he was being talked about as if he was a truly large, they were talking about him in this book as if this man was the size of a building and she was an ant who was just foaming at the mouth to get crushed. I'm gonna need the bar to be a little bit higher. Look, I know it's gonna hurt, but I'm just gonna say it. Being muscular and six foot four and an asshole is not a personality trait. <laughs> it's just so funny. There is this deep fascination with these cishet white male protagonists in romance specifically that are assholes. They don't socialize well, right? They don't have fantastic social skills, but are not coded for neurodiversity. They just simply never had to develop these skills and treat other people as decent human beings because they've been given the world itself since they were literally born. And then you pair that with features that are considered to be conventionally attractive. And that is where just this love for these kind of love interests comes from and that doesn't work for me it's not something that i personally find attractive and so when i have to read 400 pages of this boring bland cookie cutter soggy white bread ass man who is sitting in a chair breaking beds just by sitting on them making his love interest look like an amoeba when she stands next to him it just does absolutely nothing for me it makes me more and more of a lesbian every single on every single page while reading this book my vagina literally sewed itself up it escaped. It crawled away. Somebody come catch it. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? The vagina that used to belong to me. And then we have to talk about this sex scene. I love a slow burn as much as the next person, especially because like you guys know that I'm not big into romance. I've said it for years. It's just not my thing, obviously. And so because of that, I really do enjoy slow burn romances, slow burn relationships because it, it gives me more time to dredge up a feeling of concern and care about these characters. Right, it makes everything a little bit more believable for me. And so while reading this book, you'll see it in the reading vlog that I did, the reading experiment vlog that I did for The Spanish Love Deception. While reading this, I actually started to get fatigued by the fact that there was no banging happen. No banging was happening. And I was getting even more bored because what we were getting to deal with was the absolutely childish Tommy Pickles and Angelica Pickles ass antics between these two babies. And I was sick of it. So I was like, okay, let's just go to Pound Town and move on. And then they went to Pound Town. So there's a scene and you can see me react to it in this video. He tells her that he wants her. <laughs> I can't even say it to milk him like a cow moo moo so we're not only thirsting over jurassic park but also a got milk advertisement from the 90s and that was when my nether regions went and so i was like wow i should not have asked for the sex scene but i did and so here we here we fucking go oh hold on my lights aren't on You're going to see a lot of continuity issues with these with this video because construction is starting and stopping right outside my window and i really need to get this video filmed so i'm trying to like pause the video when the construction starts up because i've been trying to film this video for like two weeks y'all they're just doing their thing doing their jobs you know 
but it always conflicts with what I'm trying to film. So I'm like, I'm trying to not annoy y'all with the construction sounds in the background. So this is me trying to do a solid, okay? This is me attempting to have quality production value on this channel. And I don't know why, because y'all are here for trash. Y'all are here for a trashy time, not a quality time. I just don't see the appeal. I really do not see the appeal of Aaron Blackford. Why the hell did we need to be reminded on every single page that his name was Aaron Blackford? I am so, I have never, I have never in my entire life while reading a book been forced to hear a character's first and last name so many freaking times. It was like every single page she would be like, and there he was. Aaron Blackford. He walks into the room the way he was born. Aaron Blackford. I walk into the lunch room and Aaron Blackford is sitting there. Aaron Blackfordy eating a sandwich with his Aaron Blackford mouth. Honestly, so much of this book just gave Twilight. Like, I'm just gonna fucking say it. And as far as I'm concerned, this is Twilight fan fiction. And then on every single page, we are also being reminded that Aaron Blackford's eyes are blue. The amount of times that this man's blue eyes were being described as simmering, the amount of times. I wish I had a cookie. It was literally the most repetitive book I think that I have ever read. It was like the author's character development for Aaron Blackford started and stopped with three features, his size, his fucking name, which isn't a feature, but his name was made a feature in the book. That's how much his name was cited. And then also the fact that he has blue eyes. The way that we were told so many fucking times that this man's eyes were blue, that his name was Aaron Blackford, that he was big, it was over and over and over again. And I was thirsting for literally any other detail. Tell me about the man's nose. Tell me about his lips. Tell me about something else, his cheekbones, just anything else. It was like those were the only three things that the author could say about the dude. Dude, he didn't even convince you that he was a whole character. He's literally a random collection of floating features on a woolly mammoth doesn't make any sense. I don't understand how the bar for white male love interests is so low. It's so low. All you gotta be is tall, big, but otherwise your body fits into conventional standards of beauty and be an asshole to the protagonist at some point. Then we gotta talk about the reason that these two hate each other. Again, this is another miscommunication trope, which I'm just so sick of seeing. And this is why so many romance books get on my nerves because they just hinge, they ride off of miscommunications. And I don't get it. I don't understand the love for the miscommunication trope. Personally, it just doesn't make sense. I'm gonna need my adults to communicate. I'm gonna need conflict that's not rooted in two whole ass adults acting like babies. Aaron basically is like, yeah, I was an asshole to her on my first day of work and that is what caused us to not get along. So for three years, instead of, I don't know, apologizing to the girl, he pines after her. He spends three years pining after this girl like a tree in the forest. Aaron is pining after this girl like his first name is Chris. And then he's just going on talking to her family about how he regretted what did he say? Hold on, I wrote this quote down. What did he say? Meeting her family and he's in Spain on a whole ass vacation with her. And he's talking to her family about how he treated her on the, the first trip. Mind you, they're still fake dating. And he hasn't said to the girl, you know, like, hey, I apologize. He hasn't apologized to the love interest at all, but he has the nerve to talk to her family and be like, I sincerely regret how I treated her. You regret it, but you're not gonna apologize. So what this man does is he spends three years pining after this girl instead of walking up to her and saying, I'm sorry for how I treated you on my first day here. Can we start over? The bar is in fucking hell. This man literally flies to Spain while being wildly secretly in love with this girl instead of just apologizing for how he treated her. He like makes this big fucking motion picture production out of trying to get her to fall in love with him instead of just simply apologizing like a whole adult. Honestly, that would have been so much more romantic. It would have saved us all a lot of time. Second, why the hell was this book so freaking long? Why was this 400 pages of miscommunication of these two adults acting like absolute babies and of weird milking sex scenes of Jurassic Park of just, it just was so absolutely, it was over the top. It was ridiculous and none of it made sense. And if it hadn't been so repetitive, I would have been able to look past a lot of these these issues. 
but I couldn't because the issues kept slapping me in the mouth. God, it was just so fucking bad. I just don't understand how the bar is so low. The other thing about the Spanish love deception that really got on my freaking nerves was how it was so clear that he was in love with her. And the protagonist is just wildly oblivious. And it's not that she's oblivious. It's like the girl wasn't even listening. You have whole lines where he looks at her and says things like, I would do anything for you. I honestly started writing these quotes down because they were so fucking ridiculous. I don't think I'd be able to deny you a single thing if you ask. What about that does it make it clear that this man is in love with you? And so he's saying things like this on like every page in her on their trip to Spain, saying the most profound, he's literally being like, hey, I'm in love with you. And she's like, does he truly have feelings for me? Is this a part of the fake dating? Bitch, no, he literally just said, I flew to Spain just to be with you. And if y'all think I'm overreacting about how repetitive this book is, just listen to some of these examples that I wrote down. They're actual quotes, they're not paraphrasing, they're actual quotes. The blue in his eyes, glazing his big body aaron's large body paw-sized hands the blue of his gaze stoic so stoic so serious the blue in his eyes his large palms the blue in aaron's eyes simmered aaron's large body his large body his hungry blue eyes he stood tall and big his ocean blue eyes a pair of big hands every page it, it, it reads like that every page i don't understand this is getting an adaptation this has a million reviews on goodreads and i have no hope for humanity all right, so the next book that we have here is Very Bad Apples, Very Bad People by Kit Frick. This is a YA dark academia thriller that is set at a boarding school. And we are following a girl who is Calliope and she is one of three sisters. And when they were kids, their mother put them in a van and pulled them out of school, put them in a van and then promptly drove the van into the water and she died and Calliope was able to save her two sisters, but she's very, very haunted by this occurrence. And she's, you know, the, the sisters are always whispered about in the town. And so they're, they're very eager to get out of this town. And she kind of escapes the small town and goes to this elite boarding school that is called Tipton. When Zoe begins attending Tipton Academy, so happy that nobody knows her, nobody knows her past, nobody knows the things that she has suffered and endured, she's able to create an identity all her own. And when she begins attending Tipton Academy, she gets tapped by this secret society called the Ghosts. They have been around Tipton for years and they essentially are a secret society that serves the function of social justice on campus. Throughout the years, these ghosts have been responsible for ensuring lots of changes on campus, such as better wages for cafeteria staff, for making sure that students of color have equal admission opportunities. And so she gets tapped by these ghosts and is really excited to be um, working with a secret society that actually cares about change and making good things happen. But then as she joins the secret society, she finds out that oh God. construction started up again. So <sighs> we're going to break. I'm so fucking into it. I just want to film this video. One hour later. And that premise is kind of cool, right? Because it talks about how within social justice movements and within social wellness movements, there need to be, there needs to be checks and balances to make sure that we're doing things ethically and responsibly. And that just because we have a common goal, doesn't mean that we're all going to agree on how to go about it the same way. And it's also meaning that not everyone's way of executing getting to that goal is necessarily healthy. And that's why it's so important to have different perspectives for us to be taking care of each other and balancing each other and questioning each other's actions, that kind of thing. But these people just took shit way too far. The reason that this book wasted so much of my freaking time, the little precious time that I have left on this planet, is because it didn't make any freaking sense. We were promised dark academia. We were promised some nuanced discussions about social wellness and social wellness movements through kind of this metaphor through this secret society that's called Haunt and Rail. And I really liked that instead of the secret society being exclusive, it was about inclusivity, right? It was about how to make the world and how to make campus a safer place. And you find out that this society has existed almost as long as Tipton Academy itself and that so many important influential people have been a part of the society and it's a really big deal. It's not only legendary, but they have so many methods for courting the people who join the society and for making and, and making sure that it is equal, that it's not just one person having power to make all of these decisions. And it's actually really, really cool the kind of checks and balances that are in place to make sure that the secret society 
is going about lobbying for social change on campus in a way that is ethical and fair to all the members in the society. So for example, in order for them to kind of take on a case, all 18 members of the society have to agree unanimously that it is a cause that they want to take on. So if even one person is like, no, I don't want to do this, then the whole campaign gets squashed. And I think that that's really, really cool that it's about agreement and making sure that we're all on the same page before we're going to decide like, hey, let's you know, try and take down this messed up teacher. The book very painstakingly sets up all of this history about how this society has survived for so freaking long simply because it's been so ethical and so well upheld. Why is that? Okay, I'm sorry. It was Akasha's hair was on my body. And it just so quickly departs from that that it made my head spin. This is a YA thriller, right? So it, of course it's not going to be the most serious thing in the absolute world. I read the audiobook, which allowed me to suffer through this book in a way that was semi-enjoyable. And part of the reason that I didn't mind this book was because there's a mystery within a mystery. Calliope is convinced that there was someone else in the car when her mother drove it into the lake. And she's convinced that all of this is actually attached to the haunt and rail society that she is now a part of, which is cool. That's pretty epic if you ask me. Unfortunately, that's where the epicness starts and stops with this book. The secret society is the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen. It is about these people coming together so that they can enact these small, I don't want to say small, but these, these micro changes on campus that lead to the macro effect of making campus a safer place, right? So making sure that cafeteria workers are paid well, right? How did we get to murder? How did we get from, okay, let's make sure that Jimmy in the cafeteria is making a livable wage to let's kill this man. It just didn't make sense. We jumped from small scale things to murder real quick. And then all of a sudden murder was a whole justifiable action when before these kids could barely agree on whether or not we should get the cafeteria person a fair wage. Now all of a sudden people's bodies are being chopped up. There's a whole wiping down, there's blood on the walls. I'm just, I was like, what the fuck is going on? What is happening in these books? These kids went from zero to 60 real quick. And the explanation as to why they decided to kill a whole man did not, um, that did not, that did not go well. And I did not buy the motivations for how these kids ended up committing this extreme crime. And our protagonist ends up getting sucked into this crime. I'm not gonna say how, this is, that's as much about the plot as I'm going to say. Protagonist ends up getting sucked into this crime and essentially kind of blackmailed into remaining a part of it and she had at so many points in time she had so many options and what she continued to do was to let i'm donating my one remaining brain cell to this character she consistently made the worst freaking choices out of any character that i have seen in quite a long time this is why i cannot be in a thriller book because you can't blackmail me you just can't you just can't, I'll go to jail so fast because I'm not going to get blackmailed by Karen. I'll tell you that right now. I would much rather go to jail. It felt like the book started off really strong and then kind of crumbled and went nowhere. The book had so much going for it. I thought the secret society was super cool. I thought they were really interesting characters, although it does this thing where it specifies black characters and characters of color, but not white characters. And that always irritates me. The author would make sure to tell the reader like, hey, this character is black. While whiteness for everyone else is just assumed. It didn't take off a star rating for it. It wasn't something that like offended me, but it is something that I've noticed. And it's been a pet peeve of mine ever since I was a kid. Sorry, I cut my dog is doing that really creepy thing she does when she wants to get let in where she takes her giant snout and pokes the doorknob with it. It's kind of creepy, but it's so fucking cute. This book absolutely crumbled in terms of the twist. I feel like we were trying, the author was trying to make the book more spicy and it didn't make it believable along the way how these kids went from, okay, let's make these small microscopic changes to let's take a whole life. And I didn't buy the villains in the book. I didn't buy that these kids would go along with this freaking person's plan. I just, there was nothing about it that was believable in, in, especially because of the fact that it started off so strong and elaborate. And that's like the reason that I was so disappointed by how the latter half of the book was handled because it just felt like everything fell apart. Now let's talk about Ecstasia. I just wanna be the first to say that I've waited four years for this book, almost as long as I've been on booktube. I read Saw Kill Girls by Claire Legrand, same author of Ecstasia. See, she doesn't even wanna hold herself up. She's ashamed. Look, 
she doesn't even want to be here. Saw Kill Girls is one of my favorite YA paranormal thriller horror books of all time. It might it might even be my favorite. It's a really fantastic book and now I'm scared to reread it because I'm worried it's not going to stand up to the test of time. But long story short, Claire Legrand has not written anything since Saw Kill Girls came out, which I believe was in 2019. Honestly, we see why because look how this turned out. Man, I just, I loved it. I'm It, it was my old school book two days. I read it with um, Raviv and Jess, who I don't believe that Jess has a channel anymore. We were all really, really small booktubers and it was like the first buddy read I'd ever done on booktube. And I can't remember if we vlogged the experience or not, but it was like but the first time I'd ever had a group chat where I was reading a book with other people. And it just was a really magical experience. It was like my first Halloween on booktube. It was really fun. And so that, that whole experience has impacted the way that I see Claire Legrand as an author because she was a part of this really special moment in time for me. And all of that being said, the book itself, Saw Kill Girls, was absolutely phenomenal. It was sapphic, it was witchy, it was social commentary, it had great asexual rep. There were so many things about it that I really, really enjoyed. I found out that Extasia was coming out. I didn't release my official, you know, top books of 2022 that I'm excited about, but I kept the list on my computer and it was, I swear to God, it was in my top 10. I have been so excited about this book. And then I read it. And I just think that maybe being happy and excited isn't for me. We are following a girl who is a saint in this cult. She lives in this cult community where there are a, a sanctioned group of saints who are charged with unburdening the town of its sins. Essentially what happens is they'll have these ceremonies where they will basically beat the crap out of these girls in order to expunge themselves of their own sins and they'll have confessions and it's pretty terrible. It's very Handmaid's Tale-esque. It's very much like these girls are the priests that you're confessing to, except while doing the confessing, you also get to brutalize the priest. It is a very, very dark and brutal society. And our main character is extra pious because her mother was excommunicated from the cult for being an adulterer and for seducing one of the cult leaders. And she flees to the woods and also, you know, loses her mind. Because she's grown up with the shadow of her mother's legacy over her head, our main character tries to be extra pious, to be extra good, to be the best saint. But also because of that, she is the one who has to receive the most punishment. The town's men and boys start turning up murdered in the most gruesome, brutal and creative ways. She turns to the devil in order to save her town. I wanna to start by saying that this is one of the most violent books that I've ever read, especially books that are geared towards young adults. It is very brutal. There is a lot of violence against girls. There's a lot of content warnings for this book. It was very, very shocking. It was very heavy on the religious horror and on the cult elements. And that those are two things that I really actually really enjoy. I love cults. I love books that have religious components, even though I'm not religious myself. I'm attracted to horror of different kinds. The horror that can come out of religion is very fascinating to me, especially to be explored in a narrative such as this one, especially one for young adults. Where I was like, oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. He ends up getting indoctrinated into this group of witches that are making sacrifices to the devil. They are able to wield this power that is called extasia. And so you're learning about extasia. There is a whole hell of a lot going on in this book. This book has a lot going for it. The writing was creepy and atmospheric and the gore was amazing. It definitely delivered on that same gore and horror and creepiness, the vibes that I love so much from Saw Kill Girls. You know automatically while reading this book that Claire Legrand wrote it and I read it via, audi via audio, via audibly, what? And it was phenomenal. The narrator did an amazing job, which is why it's getting a 1.5 star <laughs> and not a one star. But here's the problem with Extasia. It has so much going for it, just like very bad apples or very bad people, very bad people, whatever. I don't know why I want it to be an apple so bad. I want it to be an apple so that I can go with Aaron Blackford's milk. Unfortunately, this book falls into the same trap that a lot of YA books fall into, not just YA, because this happens a lot in adult literature too. And the thing that I'm referencing is just absolutely ham-handed handling. Handling? of the themes in this book. It was so over the top trying to tell you that sexism in religion exists. And it was like, we get what you're trying to say. You don't need to 
continue to beat us over the head with this concept. And the way that the author did that was through showing repeated violence against these girls and their bodies. And it just, it became very excessive. It was like, okay, we get what's going on. We get it. We get the point that you're trying to make. Kids are smart. Kids are smart enough to understand these themes without needing an author to spell it out so many times with so many repeated scenes of violence against girls. It just, it got to the point where it was absolutely excessive. I hate seeing this in adult literature. I hate seeing it in young adult literature. I absolutely can't stand it. It became so exhausting. And that is, again, the thing that I hated about the Spanish love deception. That is an adult romance book. It was just exhausting getting hit over the head with the same thing over and over again. And even though that same thing was Aaron Blackford's penis. So that was my biggest qualm with the book. And then we get to the ending, holy funking barnacles. I want to spoil this so bad just so I can say exactly point blank why this book wasted so much of my time. Three chapters and I can't say for sure because I was listening to the audiobook so let's see if I can kind of find. From roughly page 397 to page 483 that means under 100 pages. This amount of pages here there's a twist at the end of the book where the book shifts basically into a whole new fucking genre. Something else is introduced into the story to explain what's happening and the magnitude of the explanation. Okay, I literally can't talk about why this book wasted so much of my time without spoilers, so I'm just going to put a timestamp down below. At the end of this book, she leaves, she escapes from her cult and finds out that beneath the mountain under the sea where her freaking village resides is a whole modern ass city and she's been living in like the 1920s and there's a whole modern sci-fi super advanced city world out there and it just makes no fucking sense so we get introduced to that in under eight in under 100 pages the shit isn't explained she ends up in a lab she overthrows the lab nothing is making sense why are there so many flying saucers it just i was like it, it was like, okay, you know, it, it made no sense. I just don't understand how we went from a cult in the woods to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It didn't make any fucking sense. And in a hundred, under a hundred pages, and absolutely none of it was explained. It was just dumped on the reader. The reader just had to fill in the blanks. So you know when you're having a dream, you're sleeping, you're minding your own business, and you are in a library and you're talking to your crush and your crush proposes that you guys get married. And then all of a sudden you are swimming in a sea of spiders. That was exactly the kind of shift. It was so jarring and there was no explanation of how we got there. There was no explanation of where we went to from there. It just, it just didn't make any fucking sense. And this would have been fine if the pacing of the book had been adjusted to actually build up this twist and let it unfold. We had such a massive freaking change in shift tone and genre for the story and it was all trying to be squeezed into under a hundred freaking pages then why did we have to spend 300 pages watching this poor girl get beat up by men in the woods it didn't make any sense it literally we should have had at least 200 pages if that was going to be the twist we should have had 200 solid pages devoted to what was happening and spent way less time watching these girls get beat up by grown-ass men absolutely not i am so disappointed in claire legron i'm so disappointed in the story uh, the best thing about that book was the cover. And finally we have Brother by Anya Allborn. This is an extreme nail in my coffin. It is it is a big stake through the heart that I barely have because this was one of my most highly anticipated horror books like of all time. Yeah it's been out for a while but I mean that I have been dying to read this book ever since I first learned about it. It is the book that put Anya Allborn on the map. She is like the number one horror best-selling horror author on Amazon. And Brother is the book that made her famous. It's a book about this family of cannibals and you have the youngest son whose name is Michael. He decides that, you know, he doesn't want a cannibal. He, he doesn't want to be like the rest of his family. And he starts falling in love with a girl. And then unfortunately his brother turns his eyes on that very same girl. Wow, that sounds so freaking cool. I'm really excited about that. I love demented families. I love cannibals. I love kind of stories that are like set in cabins in the woods. And it, it just, it's checking all the boxes, especially because it's the book that made her so famous. And I have read two or three, three other books by Anya Allborn, and I really enjoyed all of them. I gave them, I think I gave them all like a solid three stars, which for horror is really, is a really, really good rating for me especially. And I buddy read this with Jan and we were reading it together and annotating it. And just, we both were like, what, what the actual fuck is going on in this book? This book is a catfish. I have never been catfished so hard. So in this freaking video, we have cows, we have catfishes, we have Jurassic Park, 
we have i forget what extasia was oh we've got apples okay the, there's so many fruits vegetables and animals in this fucking video that i honestly should have just been eating throughout it i hate being misled my father already misled me when he said he was going to love me forever okay i don't need to be misled by horror books too first of all the cannibal angle of this book does not exist there are two scenes of cannibalism no one the fact that I have to even question whether or not it was one or two scenes is the fucking problem. We don't get to see cannibaling happen until, okay, this is page 145, right? Well after, pa oh, nope, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, we get cannibaling of page one on page 172. 172 is when we finally get a cannibal scene out of this cannibal horror book. And I've already read a cannibal horror book that disappointed me in the same way. I talked about it in a books that wasted my time video and that like i said that playlist is linked down below why are y'all catfishing cannibal all you gotta do i want to see some lady fingers i want to see your fingers served up on a platter i want to see a head in an oven i want to see a leg of lamb except it's a leg of larry i'm so upset that i had to sit through almost 300 pages 319 pages of the most mediocre fucking shit that I have ever read and not get the cannibaling that I was promised. And the reason that this book is so upsetting is not because that there was a fake cannibal ass angle. It's not because of that. It's because we were promised a dark family, okay? We were promised a, a, a family of just twisted, demented people. That's not the fuck what this was. That is not what Brother is about. What Brother is about is this mother who is abusive and she like reigns with terror. So the sister in the book and the father of the book and even the older brother who's doing the tormenting all don't want to be doing what they're doing. Their mom is making them do everything. So everyone else is just like abused and miserable in the story. The older brother does have a lot of demented tendencies. So you can argue that like him and the mom are kind of like in on it together. Our protagonist, the dad, and the little sister, none of them want any fucking part of what's going on. And so it's not a demented family. It's literally just this mom who is not a compelling character at all. She's given no characterization. She is just really rude and like disrespectful and brutal and you know, insane, which is cool because it's horror. But it's like, if that's going to be the case, if she's going to be the villain of the whole book, she's got to be more scary than that. You know what I mean? She, I, I need more for her character. If her character is going to be the one that is carrying all of the horror in this book, I need you to make that bitch formidable. Okay. I want her to be a monster truck. Like you just weren't getting that. You were just getting abusive, shitty mom who is making her whole family eat people. And so everybody's crying all the time, especially Michael. Michael is the whiniest bitch I've ever met in my fucking life. And I get it. Like, you know, he got kidnapped. He's being made to eat people. His life is not going well. I do understand why Michael is crying so much, but it just got so excessive. It just got excessive. He's just whining about his life. And I'm like, okay, look, you either need to wake up and kill everybody or you need to get the fuck up out the town. Like you need, you, you, you need to do one. But me reading about you crying about how mean your brother is to you is not doing it. And that's the other thing too, is like, we were also promised demented older brother. And it really just felt like his older brother was a shitty bully. I was expecting his brother to be doing creative shit, like locking him in closets and making him like kneel on a bed of nails. And his brother was just saying a lot of homophobic shit to him, buffing him on the head. And brother just felt like a really shitty bully. And so this book didn't sell me on the horror. I was not scared of the family. I was not scared of the mom. I was not scared of the brother. And there was no cannibalism. Yeah, he's sadistic, but like, he's not believable. You don't even take him seriously. Y you can't take this character seriously. Nobody who reads this book takes Reb seriously. Absolutely no one, even within his own family, he's considered a joke. He's not given respect even in his own family. How am I going to respect you as a villain if your own family doesn't even respect you? Even the author is clearly writing you in a way that's comical. It did nothing for me. There was nothing creepy. There was very little actual horror in it. And it's literally just 300 pages of this family bickering, fighting. I don't want to see you fight. I want to see you chop, chop, chop. It's a horror book. There's a lot of ableist language. There's a lot of, there's a lot of content warnings. You know what I'm saying? Also like, do you guys see this font? What is this? What? What kind of typewriter ass font is that? I don't know what Anya Alborn's deal was with the word birth in this book, but for some reason the word birthing and birth was used to describe things absolutely unnecessarily. Like it was getting suspicious at one point. The way he smiled birthed a feeling of horror. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? What is going on? Also, there's like an incest component. Also, oh my God, we gotta talk about the twist. The twist. <laughs> 
I could have predicted this twist before I predicted my father walking out on the family. There was literally a spotlight being shined on the twist. The twist was hinted at so heavily that by the time it happened, you already knew every single fucking detail of the twist. It was so violently, glaringly obvious. I gave it a one star. I don't even know what you guys want me to say. Where, where are these books? These four books, this is literally a thousand pages of disappointment. I regret, I regret picking up these books. I really, really do. In the very, very bottom of my description, I have the link to my Pango, which is my bookstore where I sell new and used books. And I just sold this annotated copy of the Spanish Love Deception. And then I'm going to be putting up my annotated copy, which I buddy read with Jan of Brother on there. This is brand new. I actually didn't even read this copy because I read it via audio. So this is a brand new copy of Extasia I'm putting up there. I'm also putting up my copy of Very Bad People by Kit Frick, which I did not read physically. I just read it audibly. So these two brand new books are going to be up there. And then this annotated copy of Brother is going to be up there if any of you want that. And then also for those of you who have never used Pango before, if you use the code BOWTIES, you get $5 off your first order. And most of the books on there are between $5 and $10. So that's all the way at the bottom of my description under ways to support my channel, I think is what the little header is called. Thank you so much again to Ana Luisa for sponsoring another one of my videos to get 10% off your first order. I also have a Patreon with where I make content exclusively for my patrons every single month. That is linked down below if you want to support me and my channel in further ways. All right, y'all stay safe, be good to yourselves, be good to others, and I can't wait to see you in my next video.